Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Mickey Collins, who, as you know, is the executive director of the UPMC Sports Medicine Concussion Program. And I think this is going to be uh, plenty of questions in this one, too. Thank you. We have made, we're, we're adjusting on the fly here. When we started the lecture today, I thought there was two entirely separate groups coming morning, afternoon. So I am going to save you going through a formal lecture. Um, and actually, I'm excited about it. While, he, while you're doing your lecture, I just put together some other things that I thought would be very useful for the audience. So what I want to do um, is two things, and this will be quick. Actually, three things. One is I'm going to actually show you guys the VOMs, which I think would be very, uh, very, very good for you to learn to see how we actually do that exam, that five-minute exam. I'm going to have Ann Muka help me with that. Um, the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sh show you a case, a new case that I didn't, haven't, I didn't present this morning. And the third thing, I'm going I'm to answer questions. So with that being said, Ann, um, if you could pull up the VOMs. Um, I thought it would be a good exercise for you to learn and how to actually conduct this examination, not saying you, will, you should employ this immediately without doing perhaps more research. Um, but I think it starts to give you an idea of how we're looking at this from a clinical exam standpoint. Ann? Sure. So the, um, I think some of the um, discussion earlier, you know, and, and the, the big problem sometimes is access to care. And so I think in the concussion world, knowing that that's an issue, it's very smart to have um, tools that are very readily available, don't require much equipment, that can be... Um, Train or that people that have um, maybe not high level backgrounds, so you don't need a neurologist to do these types of things. You can have maybe an athletic trainer, a physiotherapist, a primary care physician. People on the front lines can do these tests, and we think that that's that's critical for um, for managing our young athletes. So we'll show you our quick screen, and and the idea behind the VOMS is that there are good measures of assessing. Um, vestibular function, the balance component of vestibular function, there's the, the best test, and, and that's been out there. But the reality is, is that um, the real problems don't come from balance impairment after concussion. The real problems come from these vestibular ocular and ocular issues, and there was no test out there to screen for that, identify it early, and then, you know, try to, to impart um, treatment with, for it. So, so this where that's how this tool developed, um, and we um, we published a paper in 2014 on it. But we thought we would share it with you, um, and then you can read the paper, um, and then you'll get, I believe, all of the the slides, and they have the more detailed instructions as well. So we'll demo it. Um, where's the? I'm, I'm the guinea pig. Yeah, we'll thanks. make Mickey be the patient. So it, I do, for the most part, you'll have your um, your patient sitting in a chair, but we'll show it standing so that you can you see better. Um, I think it's better to stand okay. because there's a, and please, if anybody wants to move up for this, please do. <clears throat> so these are the components. Um, you're looking at pursuits, you're looking at saccades, you're looking at near point of convergence, you're looking at VOR, and you're looking at visual motion sensitivity. All of those constructs that we talked about earlier today that have, we see sensitivity time and time again, these are ways to quickly assess it. And it's a screen. So know that this is very quick. If, if you do find problems, that's when you send to somebody that can evaluate it a little bit more and then treat it. But assessing or screening for it is, is key. So basically what you do is you find baseline information on your patient first. What is their baseline level of headache, dizziness, nausea, fogginess on a 0 to 10 scale? So that's the first step. And then beyond that, you're looking for what is provoked by each individual test item. Um, you assess everything by symptom report except near point of convergence, which is also um, accompanied by a measure of near point of convergence. All right, so it should be brief to do. All right, so smooth pursuits. Um, so what you do, and I'll, I'll shout, so if anybody can't hear me, please, um, please say. But what you want to do is to test pursuit movements. You need to make sure that the patient is going about 30 degrees in all directions. So quick rule of thumb, stand three feet from your patient and assess in a framework of three feet for the motion. So I used my fingertip and I asked Mickey to, after I've assessed his baseline symptoms, please follow my finger without moving your eyes, or without moving your head, just move your eyes. And I'm gonna go horizontally um, back and forth in about three feet. 
back and forth two times, and then vertically two times. Okay. I've never done this before. I know. <laughs> I can tell. It's almost have to. So anyhow, and then at that point, I ask him, so tell me what's your headache, zero to ten. So she, yeah, I, I would, I, right. zero headache. Dizziness, zero. nausea, fogginess, all those four measures, I'm recording that. Next thing are saccades, so same frame, three feet by three feet, three feet from your patient. I'm going to have him look from this point to this point quickly as he can ten times. So as fast as you can, ten times, just eye movements. So back and forth, ten. Symptoms, zero to ten, all those four items, headache, dizziness, nausea, fogginess. Vertically, ten times. Eight, nine, ten. And patients with concussion will be very slow with this. They will be, um, you will see it in their eyes. You'll see, you know, that they can't complete it because they become symptomatic. So all of those things are relevant, but you're trying to kind of force this. Um, so again, symptoms, headache, dizziness, nausea, fogginess. Third thing you assess is convergence near point. So what I would use is, um, I t you could use something like this, which is an accommodative stick, but I just have a popsicle stick that I've taped um, a, a letter or a number that's 14 point font size. And I just have that in my pocket all the time. You know, just use Arial font or whatever you want. 14 point, because that's normal newspaper print size. And what I ask my patient to do is to hold it at arm's length, bring it in as close as they can towards their eyes or towards their nose, and stop if and when that target splits into two where they see double. Not about blur, where they see double. So um, we'll use the dot on this one because the letters are too small. So I'm going to have them look at the dot and bring it in and stop where it's two. Now, where his near point of convergence is either where he reports double or where I see his eye, one eye drift out, where there's an exo deviation of one eye. That's his near point, and I'm going to take a tape measure in centimeters and measure from the tip of the nose to that near point. Okay? And then you're going to take three measures of that because with patients with concussion, oftentimes the first measure is normal, but as you do it two or three times, that starts to fatigue, and that's concussion. Yes? <coughs> Your point of convergence doesn't matter. It's not an age-related phenomena. Accommodation is. So convergence, it's not about blur. It's about diplopia. So it does not matter. They do need to have your best corrected lenses on, though. So if you have somebody that does have reading glasses, whether they're young or old, they should be looking through the reading part of their lens to do it. But honestly, it doesn't matter. That five, and so what's abnormal is five centimeters or more um, from the tip of their nose, average of that. Okay, and then again, I ask about symptoms after three measures. So he has three, I measure each one, I record each one as far as the measure, and then I also ask about symptoms after the, that test. All right? <clears throat> Wait, what do you, you need? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So those are the ocular items. Now we're going to look at the vestibular items. And for this, because the vestibular system is very velocity dependent, um, what I recommend is that you get a free app on your phone that is a metronome that will help to make sure that you're ensuring that movement is fast enough. So um, we've, I've downloaded a free metronome app on my phone, and for looking at the VOR, we recommend that you're having your patient move their head at 180 beats per minute, which corresponds to 2 hertz, which is vestibular system movement. So if you can hear that, that's the speed. So what I'm going to ask Mickey to do, and I'll usually hold the target about 3 feet from him, and I'm going to have him focus on, I'm going to still use the dot on this one, focus on that target. And he's going to keep it in focus, but he's going to move his head back and forth at that speed. Now, the amount of movement is important also. It's 30 degrees to each side. Or, I'm sorry, it's 20 degrees to each side. So a total of 40, um, 40 degrees of motion, just like you're saying no to somebody emphatically. So you're going to move your head at that speed. Ten cycles. Seven, eight, eight, nine, ten. Good. Stop. Now, for this one, you wait just a few seconds. Uh, the instructions say 10 seconds, but at least a few seconds. Then you ask about symptoms. Because if you try this yourself, there's a certain amount of dizziness when you stop that is normal. 
So brief dizziness is perfectly normal, but prolonged is not. So that's why we wait a few seconds, and then again I ask about headache, dizziness, nausea, and fogginess. We repeat the exact same thing vertically, 10 cycles up and down is one, two, three, Good. Headache, dizziness, nausea, fogginess. Report it. And then the very last one is visual motion sensitivity. This is kind of that idea of how sensitive are you to visual flow behind you. Um, you take your metronome speed down to 50. Um, and what you're trying to do, again, is you're trying to get enough of an optokinetic flow behind patients so you have them stand where there's things in the background in the clinic, so it face a busy part of the clinic and they're going to just focus on their thumb. You're going back and forth five times. Good, and then wait. Same thing, a few seconds, and then ask about, especially if the light shining yeah. right in your eye. Um, so then, a few seconds later, headache, dizziness, nausea, fogginess. Um, patients sometimes will lose their balance on this one, so be smart about whether someone's standing with something behind them or you're <coughs> spotting them. Um, but that's likely to produce the most symptoms. So all of them can be done sitting except this last one, and we usually have people stand for the very last one. Okay. So quick. So that took a few minutes, and I went through every piece of it. So it's a very quick exam, unless you have a hypervigilant person. Yes. So anyhow, that's the bombs. Um, so if, let me show you an example. So these are all, this will all be in your, um, and what you get. So these are all the items, vertical, horizontal, VOR, visual motion sensitivity. Um, and what, what, the way we interpret that is that if somebody is reporting more than two total symptoms for any item, so two on the zero to 10 scale combined, um, it's extremely helpful. It means that there's, there's probably an impairment in that area. Um, if we've, I mean, Anthony can probably speak to the data about this, but um, this has now been done on a number of normal subjects, not just in this study, but now in other studies. But if you really are, are not concussed, you have no symptoms doing this test. You're almost always zero. The only exception to that are patients who have a high degree of pre-morbid motion sensitivity they do report some baseline symptoms on the, the last two items, the VOR and the visual motion sensitivity. So understanding that about pre-morbid history is important. But in general, people who are not concussed feel nothing with this test. So it's a good measure in that a positive result's pretty positive. <coughs> um, also, the near point of convergence measure is extremely powerful as well. There are a sub subgroup of people out there, a low percent in the normal population whose near point of convergence is beyond that five centimeter measure. But again, that's the exception. Um, in general, normals are well below that. Um, and we know that in particular, what's really sensitive to concussion are the near point of convergence measure, near point of convergence measure combined with the VOR item and the visual motion sensitivity items. Those are really telling. So um, in your, if you think about, um, we know that this works um, in office after concussion and we're hopeful, there needs to be some more study on it, but we're hopeful that it might even have some implications on field. That has to be you know, completely um, looked at. Um, this is just what I said. So normals don't have any symptoms at all. This is the normal population had like 0.1 symptoms on all of these items, but um, concussed patients have report symptoms that are significantly um, more across all areas. Um, this is just some of the psychometric properties of the VOMS. Um, and again, this is what we published in our article. So. Um, it was highly correlated to symptom reports and other measures, but it was absolutely unrelated to the balance measure, which is the thing you think about, well, it's another vestibular function, but they're unrelated. So that's why you need to do both things. Um, and it may help to also guide what clinical subtype patients are in. So this is just an example. Um, this was a patient who had no baseline symptoms. So this is kind of a form we would use no symptoms at baseline, no symptoms when doing the pursuit items, had two headache with doing the, the horizontal saccades for a total of two, one, one in a headache for, um, for vertical saccades, 
only a one headache for near point of convergence, but the measures were 7 centimeters, 10 centimeters, and 12 centimeters for an average of 9.7. Horizontal and vertical VOR produced dizziness at a 3 and 2 level and fogginess, and visual motion sensitivity produced dizziness, nausea, and fogginess, or I'm sorry, dizziness and nausea. So if you look at this, the way that you figure out whether this person is, is, is symptomatic and likely concussed is, you know, were their symptoms provoked over zero? And you can see there are multiple items where they really had increased symptom provocation and their near point of convergence is clearly outside of normal. So, so obviously this patient is concussed and they're probably having vestibular and ocular issues after their injury. So that's kind of how we use it. Do you have anything to add, Nick? No. I'll do okay. Now. All right. There you go. So we'll switch to the other. That was better than some stuffy lecture, I think. Um, all right. What I would like to do now is to present to you a case, and then I can take a few questions and wrap it up. Um, so, and I just put this together now, by the way. I pulled a case from like a couple years back that I had on my computer, so bear with me. But so. Um, the case I want to share with you is a, is a college hockey player, uh, and the, the interesting thing about this case is very simple, it's very straightforward. It's, it's rare that we will have only one circle that plays a role in patient's presentation, but it, it happens. And in this case, it, it was indeed the case, and what I'm going to do is present to you a case that's more ocular in isolation than vestibular, more ocular than anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here's a hockey player, and I'm going to show you the hit. If you can play the video, you're going to see him get checked into the boards over here. You can replay the video real quick. Um, if you just think about the brain and its movement inside the skull and you know helmets, um, you're just never going to st um, stop the brain from moving inside the skull when the when this happens. It's quite impressive. But anyway, and he hit the back of his head off the ice. So that's a typical event we'll see in hockey. Ice is pretty unforgiving. Um, and following this injury, you can see he lost consciousness probably briefly, one or two seconds. He was unresponsive. Um, he has about a two hour period of amnesia. So he doesn't remember the hit. The next thing he remembers is being in the hospital about two, two hours later. Um, he was spine boarded, taken to the emergency room. CT was unremarkable. Um, he is a, a high level hockey player. This is one of, the, one of the best hockey players in the country at the college level. He's what we call a Hobie Baker finalist. So Hobie Baker is, the, is the, like the Heisman Trophy for football. It's for hockey and college hockey, and he was one of the top 10 hockey players in the country. He played for a service academy in Colorado uh, called the Air Force Academy. Um, big time player. Very, very, this is a big part of his life, hockey. Um, and he's going he's gonna to be drafted, going to the NHL, National Hockey League, and he's going to make a lot of money doing it. Um, when this injury happened, um, he actually uh, was at a school um, that actually – after this injury, they evaluated him and the kid was symptomatic. They actually took him out of school completely and removed him from his service academy responsibilities. So after he got discharged from the hospital, he was seen by the team physician. The team physician said, you have a concussion. You're not going to be able to keep up with your academic responsibilities at, at this academy. Um, we're sending you home to Ohio. Uh, and you're going to live at home. And then we'll see if you're better by the time the next semester rolls around. Remember, this is an elite hockey player who's now, their, their, his hockey life is, is over for the moment, and his academics life is over for the moment, and he's now living back at home with his mother and one injury, which to me is, is, is remarkable. Um, there was no treatment recommended. It was just go home and rest. Um, so basically, from this injury, um, he uh, did have a frontal headache, fatigue, academic difficulties that first week. That's when they took him out of school and they told him to rest, et cetera, et cetera. There's no other significant medical history. So he had no prior history of concussion, no prior history of anxiety or car sickness or learning disability, nothing like that. 
He ended up um, being very unsatisfied with those recommendations and came to see me about six weeks after the event. So I'm here to evaluate the patient and he comes to see me, see me in Pittsburgh. So here was his helmet and you can see this helmet broke from the, from the force. Uh, and here was him um, right after the trauma uh, in the hospital. And it's just such an interesting um, thing that I actually can see his problems. It takes me two seconds to see it. Does anyone see what I see? I see a gash, but more specifically, you can actually see the problem that ends up causing his symptoms from a concussion if you look at him carefully. What is it? Say it again. No. There's no fracture. Correct. Which eye is off? His right eye. His right eye is, has an exodeviation, exophoria, um, or exodeviation, you can see here. Um, and I didn't even know um, until he sent me the picture, and I'm like, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, and this ends up causing him problems that go on for, you know, until I saw him six weeks later. We have treatments for this. Um, so I evaluate him and see him, um, and... At the time I saw him six weeks post-injury, he was convalescing at home. He was told, do not exert. You could cause brain damage by exertion, which, of course, is ridiculous. Um, he had symptoms of fatigue, 8 out of 10, a frontal headache, difficulty to focus, and he was very irritable, uh, sad, more emotional. And that, of course, is coming from the fact that he's now out of the sport he loves and is sitting at home when he should be in college having a good time and playing hockey and getting good grades. He's a very uh, high-level student as well. He's an engineering major. Smart kid. Um, what's interesting when you have an isolated oculomotor problem, especially uh, convergence and sufficiency, is you're going to get symptoms when you work on computers, you're going to get symptoms when you read, you're going to get symptoms when you have to focus on something at close range, um, but you can move dynamically and feel fine. Um, and that's what happened with him. And what we commonly see with symptoms from an isolated oculomotor problem is you get a headache behind your eyes and you feel really tired and you can't focus. This is not a hard case. It's just what's so fascinating to me is not a lot of people recognize it because we haven't been taught how to look at the injury in specific ways. Um, his VOMS uh, was unremarkable for any problems. I'll show you his VOMS here. Um, here's his VOMS. You can see that at baseline, he had a 3 out of 10 headache, um, zeros with dizziness, nausea, and fogginess. And you can see the only part of the VOMS that increases symptoms was neoporinic convergence. And his measures, measurements were 22, 23, and 26 centimeters with a right exophoria. Um, so his right eye would deviate out. Uh, as soon as you get to 22 centimeters, you can see his eye deviate out. Um, the rest of the VOMS is completely unremarkable. So with the VOMS, I can pretty much determine just by looking at this, that this is an ocular motor problem. We're not seeing any overt signs of vestibular dysfunction. Um, but I want to corroborate that by using our neurocognitive testing. And on impact, um, when you have an isolated ocular motor problem, we will very commonly see deficits across the domains of visual memory and reaction time. We have a baseline on him, so the college would, did baseline testing before they had it, before the season started. You can see percentile-wise, you know, only 27 out of 100 guys would do better than him, 4 out of 100, 32 out of I mean, this is a very high-level kid. And then post-injury, you can see. Now, the scores are red because we actually build in reliable change index scores for you. So statistically speaking, if you fall out of bounds, the test tells you that you fall out of bounds statistically. And him falling out of bounds um, across three or four domains is very consistent with someone who's concussed. So you combine this with the VOMs, and, and then what we also do is we exert the patient. And we exerted him, and he had zero symptoms whatsoever with all kinds of dynamic movements. Um, we had him do a lot of different dynamic movements, like I showed you the football player earlier. He had zero symptoms whatsoever by doing those dynamic movements, which tells you it's an isolated oculomotor problem. And there's no, nothing else going on. He's not anxious. There's not cognitive fatigue. It's not neck. It's not, it's not ocular. And, and it's, it's not... I'm sorry, it's not vestibular, and it is ocular. It's not migraine either. And so it, it's a pretty coherent case, and I just thought I'd show it to you. So what do we do to treat this? Well, we actually have a formal therapy called vision therapy where we can retrain the, the, the ocular motor system much like we could re retrain a vestibular system by teaching the eyes how to work together again. And there's programs available um, through 
optometry, uh, there's a program in particular called the HTS program um, that actually retrains the visual system as a software program. Um, so we had him see our neurooptometrist, who's part of our program. He was prescribed the HTS program. Um, we told him he could work out as hard as he wanted to work out. I actually wanted him back on the ice. I just didn't want him to have any uh, additional trauma, no contact. But I said, look, your prognosis, and when you have this level of oculomotor dysfunction, it takes about 10 weeks to treat. This is one that takes a little longer than others. So I told him, look, you're going to do this th home therapy program. I want to see you back at some point, make sure it's moving in the right direction. I want you to work out. I want you to be social. Um, I want you to do pretty much anything you want to do except don't get hit in the head. And then I'll see you back, and we'll see how you're doing to make sure it's working. So he did that, went home, uh, and did his therapies. And I saw him back approximately, here's after I saw him back, I think like six weeks after he started treatment. Um, and this is back 2013 when we actually didn't have that stick I showed you. We actually used a pen. Don't do that. The stick's better. But I'm going to show you the video here. Can you play the video? So he's now at about eight centimeters. Watch his right eye. Right there. You can see it start to go. Okay. Keep looking at it. And you measure from the tip of his nose to that point. See his right eye deviate? Okay. You can right, see it so very clearly mm -hmm. if you're evaluating a patient face to face. His right eye deviated. But now his right eye is deviating at, at 8 centimeters rather than 23 centimeters. His symptoms are improving. He's working out. His mood's better. He's feeling really well. Um, I end up seeing him back in June, which was nine months post-injury. The only reason I didn't see him earlier was because... He was normal, but there was no return to hockey until I saw him back. So I saw him back in June. He had to fly all the way from Colorado. I see him back on, on June 20th, 2014. Um, he finished vestibular therapy or vision therapy. It was at four centimeters. Um, here's his neurocognitive data. The second time I saw him, reaction time is very consistently uh, correlates with oculomotor dysfunction. And you can see that that's the, the one score that was off a of baseline the second time I saw him. And the third time I saw him, his data is completely back to where it should be. Um, and his, all, his VOMS was normal, um, and here's a little short video kind of, it's like a 50-second video, him talking about the experience and the treatment. If you can play that. When turn, I first saw you, what, what were the things, how did our approach, what, was, what about the approach was effective in terms of getting through this? Um, just knowing like exactly what was wrong and like having a set thing of what to do rather than just, uh, you know, just sit in a room and like wait for it to go away. Um, that doesn't help anyone, does it? No. Nah, you know, that, that was one of the biggest things is just like when you're just sitting there waiting and nothing's getting better and then, mm -hmm. you know, you just feel like, when, when is this going to change? And then um, when we actually, when I, you see even just like a little bit of progress, it helps out a lot. And, you know, what I, therapy was the most beneficial to your recovery? Definitely the vision therapy. I How long that, into that did you start feeling like, oh, not going, this isn't working? Uh, you know, like probably a couple of weeks into it, and then I wasn't getting the headaches as much, uh, you know. And, I mean, that says a lot. It, you know, if we have treatments, here's what you got, here's the treatment we're going to do, you're going to get better. This kid went back to play. He's an All-American hockey player. He's going to get drafted in the NHL. It, his career, he's had no problems since this, um, no issues with concussion. He's playing at a high level again. He's back to where he wants to be. And that's what this is all about, treat the problem. And um, anyhow, I thought that would be more productive than doing some formal lecture. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to, I've got six minutes and 57 seconds for questions. So fire away. Yeah. Uh, Mike, thank you, very, Mike, thank you very, very much for that. I want to come back to a question I asked you just before lunch, and you may not have picked up on it correctly. I had a query. Um, in Ireland, a lot of uh, sports bodies have a minimum standing down period of 14 days for those under 14 where you don't have baseline neuropsych testing and then a graduate return to play program. Um, my query was asking, was that appropriate or could people come back to play earlier? I, I believe that that 14 day thing is completely grabbed out of thin air. Um, I feel it's something that needs to be managed individually. And if you have access to the right evaluation, you absolutely can come back 14 days earlier, earlier than 14 days, if you recover within 14 days. Um, if you don't, then it shouldn't be 14 days, it should be 19 days or whatever you recover. I really am not a strong believer in, in choosing some sort of like weak cutoff because the, the outcomes are so highly variable. Um, and 
we feel pretty confident we can actually do this the right way, independent of guessing at a time. Um, and really, if you look at our research, two weeks may not be enough for a lot of these kids that we're seeing. Um, so that's my feeling on it. I also feel that if you have a two or three week sit down period, there's a lot of um, minimization um, of symptoms that can occur. I mean, if I knew I was going to have to sit out three weeks from a baseball game when I played in college because I got hit in the head and had symptoms, I wouldn't report it. Mm. There's no way in the world I report it. You have the benefit of your neuropsych testing, so we don't have the benefit of neuropsych yeah, testing. Yeah, if you don't have these things in place, um, do I agree with that still? Probably not, um, because I still think it should be individually managed, but I can see where you're coming from. I just think that we need, first of all, this care is accessible. It's something that can be taught and delivered. That's a lot of work ahead of us, and you guys don't have that right now necessarily in place. You're starting to get it with Neve and, and others around the country that are doing this, but this is what your kids should be receiving for treatment, in my opinion, and if that does occur, there's a whole lot of benefit that could, could result in your population here. Yes. Uh, that, that street looked pretty knocked about at the weekend, and yet there was only one of the um, assets that uh, was, uh, was, was affected, the ocular. Yeah. Uh, do you find a correlation between how bad it is? So you know what's interesting? It's a great question, Barry. And, and the question that Barry asked, he didn't have a microphone, is he said, I believe in his Irish way, he said that fellow was knocked about. Um, <laughs> which is exactly what you said, I think, um, which you were right. He got hit pretty hard. Um, would, it help you to t would it help you to hear that there was a family history of, of, of uh, amblyopia in the mother? So that family history of a, of a lazy eye, in this case, um, actually told you before this kid got hit in the head that this is the type of problem he would have. And that's often what happens. If there was a history of migraine, it might have presented as migraine. If there's a history of car sickness, it might have presented as vestibular. A history of anxiety might have presented anxiety. It's always fascinating to me um, how, uh, how revealing talking about patient history and family history is as to how the injury presents. And this kid presented in a very isolated ocular way, whereas some other kid would have presented differently with the same trauma. It's a great question. Any other questions? Yes. You've obviously got a huge backup there, but you certainly don't see three and a half million patients a year, and I suspect, sorry, you don't see three and a half million patients a year through your unit. Um, yep. How is it, and, and that's the scenario we're in. Yep. Uh, I mean, I saw two concussions this week. I know right. one adult, one child. Uh, to see a child neurologist for us is going to take nine months to see an adult neurologist. And the scary the thing is, is just because you send them to a child neurologist doesn't mean they're going to get the right treatment either. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and it's two years for an adult. So I, I suppose what we're, in a sense, looking for is, is there a, a, a Band-Aid way uh, of trying to deal with this? And certainly breaking it down into individual components, it might actually be easier if we knew it was an ocular, and certainly seeing the, the VOMS is incredibly helpful. Um, if we knew it was an ocular, we may be able to right. access something yeah. uh, more directly. Yeah, I mean, your point exactly. And to sit up here and to, uh, to assume that you guys have the ergonomics and the ability to get patients in to be treated by a clinic like this, is, it's preposterous. It's not going to happen. I understand that. But today's a really good day because now we're starting to talk about the injury in very specific ways. And uh, hopefully, next time you see a kid, you look at some of these things. and you, you, That's what it's all about. I, I do believe um, that we could potentially get to a point here with the right collaboration of creating a center of excellence where kids could get that treatment. And hopefully, that's going to occur. But today has been a phenomenal step at least in educating um, you all in terms of how to look at this injury. Um, it, it's not built in a day. There's no way we can accomplish that sitting here today, but that should be a goal in the future, immediate future. Yes. Um, <clears throat> sorry, it's more of a, a comment than a question that uh, I'd like to thank you for a, a hugely educational, one of the best meetings I've been at in a long time, but going on to the point of uh, 
we do get frustrated in relation to referring on to neurologists, be it a, ch uh, a child neurologist or whatever. And I'd like to agree with that fact that I don't think that is the answer either. I think the answer is actually within the room of everybody who's here to agree with that. be educated and to upskill and to recognize this ourselves. And whoever wants to be the point of referral then that the answer is amongst us, everybody that attended the meeting. Yeah, thank you for those comments, because I agree with you. I think the answer is sitting right here, because um, you probably know 10 times more than a pediatric, uh, a, not Neve, but a pediatric neurologist that has, that quite frankly, has not been trained on concussion. Do you have training for concussion in your curriculum, Neve? Exactly. So the point is, is that you sitting here saying you're not going to be able to get a pediatric neurologist for six months. Well, I'm not so sure you need one because it's not going to be very helpful the great majority of the time. There's a lot of work to be done here. We need the international consensus statements to pick up their game. Um, we need people to uh, be open um, to reading the literature. Um, and we have a lot more teaching to do. Um, if there's one thing I've learned in doing this for 16 years or, and longer is that it's a big world out there. And there's a lot to learn. And we keep learning every day. But that's also exciting because it's, a, it's an area of medicine where... Uh, there's so much that needs to be done, which is kind of cool. But your points, and, and I just want to point out that here's a gentleman that's in the western part of the country that has taken it upon himself to create a baseline testing program and is educating kids at that baseline program and starting to implement some of these treatments, if I'm not mistaken. That's the plan, and he's working hard at it. And that's what you guys should be doing as well, hopefully. Yes. Uh, I, I, I come from completely the other end of the spectrum. My 14-year-old uh, son received a head trauma in April. And as a result of it, we had tremendous difficulty in finding anything that pertained to anything that would work for him outside of the 23-day cutoff that was suggested for him. Yeah. Um, and as a result of it, we went searching on the internet as to what happens in the States and there was a consistency with coming up with a therapy called bone therapy, B-O-W-E-N, which assists in uh, decompressing the back of the neck and shoulders to allow uh, spinal fluids to flow more freely into the, into the head. Uh, I'm just wondering, have you uh, got a comment or come across that therapy at all? I have, and I'm not a big believer. Um, and we're talking about a surgical procedure that has very little theoretical um, underpinning and something I would very significantly caution you towards, um, given the lack of empirical evidence to support it. A lot of people are looking at things that are off the beaten path with this injury. Um, if it truly is concussion, I can tell you that an evaluation can get to the right source of where the signal's coming from and get, the, and get your child better. Um, it's unfortunate that there's not better information out there for people. You're welcome. Yes. Sorry, can, can, I, can I ask, what, what did the MRI scan show? Normal. Normal 100, MRI. 100%. And functional MRI. And, you know, we, can't, we cannot determine concussion on fMRI, PET, MEG, MRI, CT. Um, there's no neurodiagnostic modality that's ready for prime time to say there's concussion. We've done work on fMRI. We've published papers on it. We don't use it clinically because it doesn't tell us anything. And anyone that, that states otherwise, um, it's not scientifically validated at this point for concussion. But isn't an MRI scan essential to make sure there's nothing else going on? 100% yes, and thank you for pointing that out. An MRI is important. To, now, would I do an MRI on this kid? No, because it's something we see all the time and it's very consistent. And I don't necessarily feel we need an MRI in this case because we're so comfortable with it. Uh, but yeah, an MRI is going to rule out a, 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 a bleed, fracture, space-occupying lesion, other interparenchymal problem that can cause the issues that are independent of concussion. So oftentimes you need those to rule that out, but you don't need it to help you with concussion. In terms of, in terms of a CTE, which I suppose is the thing that really has launched concussion onto the public right. forum and obviously as a American football team background you would have big uh, concerns about that area is there a uh, issue regarding repeated concussions I know you believe your your treatments will hopefully decrease the chance of repeated concussions 
but there's loads of GA players out there that have had repeated concussions. Is there an issue at which time we need to be considering? Should that player be stepping out for longer? Should they be considering their career? Yeah, you bring up very good points, that some of which, frankly, are not answerable. Um, there's a lot of research we need to do. Um, we see a lot of people with chronic problems with concussion. The great majority of the time, we can, we can identify a problem with these systems that we're looking at and actually treat the problem and get the patient better. So we see patients chronically, years out from injury, where these treatments are still effective. A lot of time, we see chronic anxiety or other things that can be treated. Um, so my first answer to your question is make sure those patients get the right evaluation because there's things that can help them. As it relates to CTE, no one in the world could answer that question as to whether that provides a substrate of concern for that problem. The research just doesn't exist. And when you watch it in Hollywood and it makes it sound like it definitely exists, I would take issue with that um, because the science is, is very weak and we need a lot more prospective, really well done research to better understand the construct we call CTE. I'll leave it at that. Any other questions? Yes. In practical terms, for, for the likes of us who be team doctors, if we're asked to assess somebody as recovering from concussion to allow them back onto the field, yep. is if we have somebody who has symptoms that have resolved and a negative assessment on VOMS, is that enough for us to allow them back to play? Um, I think computerized neurocognitive testing would, in an optimal world, be a piece of that as well okay. uh, because you can pick up problems with that that you don't pick up on the VOMS. Sure. I would make sure the patient exerted in a very dynamic way, as we illustrated today. Yeah. The criteria that we must, you know, in our program that we achieve in every case is the patient's symptom-free at rest and exertion or symptom-free as it relates to concussion. Um, their neurocognitive data is normal, whether we have a baseline or not. Their vestibular and ocular motor systems are normal, as far as we can tell, and that they exert in a very dynamic way and it, and with the exit test, the standardized test we developed. So those are the optimal criteria, but I would argue, and hopefully you'll answer affirmatively, I, I bet you're a lot better prepared right now after today to look at this in a, in a more sophisticated way than you were before the day started. I think that's fair to say, yeah. And that's cool to hear because, you know, in a roundabout way, what you just said, yeah, I mean, it's going to be better than what you were doing probably before. So, outstanding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Um, listen, it's been a true honor to come over here and present to you, and it's been really neat to the, the relationships we started to make with the GAA and Bon Secours, and I appreciate your time. And I think you may see me again, actually, from the panel, but anyway, thank you.